Welcome to Crash Concepts, where the economy, energy, and the environment are explored. Up next, fresh ideas and insights into the factors that are driving the world and shaping your future. Presenting information you can't afford to live without, here's Chris Martinson. Welcome to another ChrisMartinson.com podcast. I am your host, of course, Chris Martinson, and today we are speaking with John Malden, author of the widely read investment newsletter, Thoughts from the Frontline, and best-selling author, his most recent book, Endgame, The End of the Debt Supercycle and How It Changes Everything, came out last year at a high praise and could hardly be more relevant to the moment in history in which we currently find ourselves. Today, he and I will explore the most probable outcomes of the global economy, and we're going to be looking at how and what might happen when we're finally forced to deal with its fundamentals Achilles heel, which can be perfectly summarized in just three short words, too much debt. John, welcome. It is a real pleasure to have you as a guest today. Uh, it is always a pleasure to be with you, and uh, thanks for the very kind words and introduction. All right. Well, you're most welcome. Uh, what I would like to do today is, is tap your expertise at explaining the difficult in such a way that everybody can understand what the issues really are. There is so much complexity involved in the global economic and financial situations today that it, it can seem overwhelmingly complex to the average or casual visitor to that rugged landscape. So uh, if we just back up a bit, though, we widen our view to the macro. I think it's possible to understand where we are, how we got here, and uh, where we might be headed next. So before we get into the particulars of Europe or the U.S. or any other region, could we start today with the debt supercycle, what it is, and why understanding it can help us figure out where everything might be headed? Well, Richard Fisher back in the uh, 30s began to talk about the debt supercycle. Most people that are in investments and, and economics will remember Richard Fisher for his statement in 1929 that the stocks were at a permanently high plateau in October, you know, just before they crashed. And, and that's what we remember him for. However, he was probably one of the greatest economic minds uh, of the last century, of, of any time. Uh, he gave us so many equations and so many insights that are fundamental to everything we do today. He was the found, uh, you know, kind of the groundwork for a lot of people, Kane, Schupeter, uh, Kendallberger, uh, Minsky. And he began to talk about that the problem that they had in the 29, in, in the 20s, and, and he went back and he was looking at the 70s, 1870s, 1820s, is there's a buildup of too much debt. And when you get too much debt, he said, there's nothing you can do but other than just let it rewind. Uh, you can't take monetary policy, which is to try to stimulate businesses to buy, to get more debt, uh, because debt is the problem. And, you know, it's like you can't, uh, if, you, if you're drunk and you need to cure yourself, uh, another fifth of the whiskey is not the answer. So when, when debt becomes a problem, when it gets to be too much, more debt is not the issue. You've just simply got to work it off. off. And as he pointed out, and other people who, who uh, for instance, the bank credit analyst named it the debt super cycle. There's no easy way out of it, and it takes years to, to work through it. Um, that's what McKinsey uh, Institute, uh, when they did their analysis, uh, as recently showed. And, and it's not every recession. It takes a long time, generally, uh, 60, 70 years in, in, in the U.S. case. To, for these debt cycles to build up. It's when you can no longer adequately service your debt and the market loses confidence in your ability to service the debt at a price that they find adequate. For instance, the United States will never not be able to service its debt. We can print money. So can the U.K. They're always going to be able to service their debt. The question becomes... If they have to start monetizing at what rate of inflation, what is the price that you're going to be paid for? Because you're going to be paid in dollars in the future that you're lending today. What are the values of those dollars going to be? Bond investors in sovereign debt are an unusual breed in the sense that they don't want any risk. It's, and I've got to emphasize that over and over again. 
They're not looking to take risk. When you buy a government bond, you're saying, I want the least amount of risk possible. So when they start seeing risk, they go, oh, ho, ho, this isn't what I signed on for, guys. And they either start asking for higher interest rates or they uh, retreat from the market altogether. Uh, and typically at some point, they retreat from the market altogether. And the only people that will go in are people that are buying distressed debt, which is what we're finding in Europe now. Uh, that's why Greek rates are, you know, something like a 90%. Portuguese rates are pushing uh, 18, 19% already because the people that are buying it are people that are buying distressed debt. The people that are selling it are saying, I'll take anything for it, whatever I can get. Um, the people are buying it expect a default, and so they're figuring the default in to the price they're paying. Well, when that happens, a country can no longer refinance its debt at a, a rate that they can make the payments. Italy, at a mere 7% interest, their debt is, they have so much debt, it's push, it's well over 120% of GDP. Well, that means it would take almost 9% of their total country's output just to pay the interest on the debt. That's not a working business model. I mean, it says, gee, it's only 9%. But if you're paying 9% of your income and you still got, you know, to pay for your housing, you still got to pay for your food, you still got to pay for your kids' education, and you're paying 9% of everything you make, you know, after taxes. I mean, 9% of everything you make before taxes, and you still got to pay your taxes. It ends up taking 20% of your, of your what's, what's available before you pay for anything else. It, that, that business model doesn't work on, on individual levels. The same thing is true on country levels. And so we rock along and rock along. You can borrow more money, you can borrow more money, until you can't. And there's no magic number. There's no, when you're at 80% or at 60% or 120% or in the case of Japan, 240%. It's when the market no longer says we think you can pay at a rate that is going to pay us for the risk. Now, this is an interesting point I'd like to follow because I think there's something new in this cycle, at least new to my observation, which is that um, the bond market, I think, was a, a, a wonderful, uh, incredible arbiter of prices and, and enforcement at some point. And we've seen recently, and by recently I mean the last 10 years, the emergence of the non-economic players, I'm, I'm code speaking about central banks now, which are, in my view, heavily distorting the bond markets through their actions, quantitative easing, the bond purchases, the balance sheet expansions. What's your view of, of the impact of, of these non-economic participants in distorting uh, the true yields that that we're seeing in the bond markets today. I mean, it's if you're a if you're a pension fund, you are captive to the idea that you're going to get zero percent on safe short term money. That may or may not be a true market um, reflection of what the interest rate ought to be. I think it's not. I think it's way too low given the risks involved here and the inflation rates that are likely, um, if not probable, going forward. So, what is what's your view on on the central banks? Are we in a new economic landscape? Can they really? hold this together forever by printing, or is, or am I missing something here? It all depends on what you mean by central banks holding it together. If, if you mean can they uh, help us kick the can down the road, yes, but they can't provide stability. We just simply have too much debt. Uh, there's no amount of central bank printing that can make that smooth. If they were just to provide the money that Greece and Portugal is going to need, let alone Ireland, uh, that will create inflation in Europe. Now, you know, maybe 4 to 5% inflation is your definition of smooth. A lot of bond market investors would go, no, we don't think that's smooth. And, and if they have to try to do something with Italy, you know, if, you know, just forget about it. The problem is there's only really two ways that you can deal with the debt. You can grow your way out of it, which is, what you can do in normal business cycles. For most times, in most places, we can grow our way out of debt problems, which is what the central bank is coming in and trying to, uh, to do. The, the problem is when you're at the end of the debt super cycle, when you're running up against your ability to borrow money, that liquidity no longer works. 
Now, the U.S. isn't there yet. We have an opportunity in 2000, in this election, 2012, and then in 2013 with the new Congress, uh, to get our deficits under control. It's not without pain, which is what I've been writing. Uh, when you start reducing your leverage, you're locking in a slower growth economy. We've used leverage to help boost our growth. Well, when you take that, that leverage off, you have the, the, the reverse effect. The time that, Fish, as Fisher pointed out, the time to solve the debt bubble is before it becomes a bubble. Uh, he was wanting uh, uh, you know, separation of, of commercial banks and, and, and lending. He wanted uh, a much less uh, uh, fractional reserve banking because he wanted the debt to keep from building up past levels uh, that, that we saw in the 20s. He saw that as something that was, you know, uh, it was so bad that it created the Depression. Uh, what we don't have from Fisher, sadly, is he never wrote the definitive book like Keynes did, like Friedman did, like von Mises did. What we've got from Fisher is his writings and especially his letters to Franklin Roosevelt, uh, towards uh, the end of Roosevelt's and in the 30s and the end of his career. What you get is one of the greatest intellectuals of all time commenting on what happened and, and what you have to do. And one of the things you have to do is just you have to work that debt off. So you can either repudiate the debt, you can default on it, you can monetize it, you can try to grow your way out of it, but you're going to have to deal with it. And there's no easy way when you're at the end of the debt super cycle, when debt has become too much. Printing money, as Fisher said, and which he advocated early on, but later he said, guys, this, this doesn't work. I've, you know, now, upon reflection and thinking about it, we've gone too far. And this is where they are in Europe. Japan is getting very, very close to that moment. Uh, I keep saying I think Japan is a bug in search of a windshield. I think they're going to collapse. And quite frankly, the, the credit crisis that Japan is going to have is going to be far more serious than Greece. Now, Japan makes a difference. They're a big country. Greece is an anthill. And, and we think of the problems that Greece is causing. We haven't even gotten to problems. The U.S. has time. We can solve our problems. But it's not without pain. Uh, we're going to be locking in a slow-growth economy. It's going to be very frustrating for politicians because they're going to want to come in and sprinkle pixie dust on the economy and make something happen. And the reality is we can't. I mean, the Reagan solution isn't available to us. Now, the remedies that, that Reagan prescribed are where we should go for, which is smaller government, lower taxes. That's one of, and, and, and we should restructure our tax code there are certain taxes which have better multipliers uh, uh, or worse multipliers, depending on your, your point of view about taxes. But, but there are certain taxes that are better for economic growth than others. But we have to just get our debt down in terms of GDP. There, there's nothing else for it. And that's a, a, a frustrating position. It's five or six years of a slow-growth economy. Well, I've noticed that um, the U.S., you know, much is made that, you know, Spain is fighting to get its deficit to 6%, but maybe, you know, with luck, they'll actually get it closer to 8% deficit to GDP. Mm -hmm. Portugal's wrestling its deficit down to 6%, and then maybe 4% by 2013, you know, as long as a recession doesn't stock the land. Italy, same deal. They're hoping to get its deficit down to 2%. Um, but the U.S., fiscal deficits higher than any of these on a percentage basis currently and on an absolute basis is just gargantuan compared to these countries I just mentioned. So so what gives here? Is there a, a set of rules for these small European states that's different for the U.S., or do you see this as a wily E. Coyote moment for the market's perceptions of the U.S.? Well, what gives is Europe is in far worse shape than the U.S. I mean, as bad as our Social Security and, and, and Medicare problems are, theirs are worse. Their debt to GDPs when you take in private debt, it's, it's, it's 100 percent more than ours, and they don't have the ability to print money. And the Germans are saying, "Nine, nine, we're not going to print money." So, uh, unless the ECB steps in, it's going to be—it has the potential to be very chaotic. And I keep saying that, and readers keep saying, "Well, you're suggesting the ECB prints," and I'm saying, "No, I'm just saying that's the only thing that's going to keep it from being 
total chaos as opposed to mere chaos. I don't know that printing money is a good answer for what Europe has. I think uh, uh, recognizing that the the euro as a concept doesn't work, and uh, you know, let's let's figure out how to unwind this guys would be. The, I think that's the smart solution. But from the from the point of view of the United States and the rest of the world, we would like the Euro, the, the ECB to go ahead and print to try to provide some ability to offset the what could be depressions in those countries and uh, uh, to provide less volatility for us. That doesn't mean it's the best thing for Europe. Uh, there are no good solutions here. I mean, I've, there's no... The, the central bank printing money doesn't solve the problem. It just is a different way to address it than default. Well, it just spreads it out over everybody instead of a, a few concentrated participants. Well, that that's correct, and, and which is why... The, the Finns and the Germans and the Dutch are, are, are saying, well, you guys, we didn't contract for the Greek and the Portuguese and the Italian. That, that was your problem. And you're wanting us to, uh, uh, you know, help pay for the problem in terms of lower buy, uh, buying power for our currencies. So that's a conversation the Europeans have to have. Uh, I mean, it's how much do they want the euro? How much do they want this concept of the union uh, versus... Uh, you know, how much do they want to pay for it? Which is the same problem the U.S. is going to have. Our problem is how much health care do we want and how much do we want to pay for it? That's what we've got to decide. That's that's our big issue. Everything else can be solved. Everything else is uh, uh, fixable. I mean, and, and I mean, the health care issue is coming home to me in a very, very personal, dear way. Uh, one of my children... Uh, who doesn't have, you know, older in her 30s, uh, has, has just developed some very, very bad scans uh, in her throat and on her thyroid. Uh, they don't look good. She doesn't have insurance. If it, if it turns out to be what it's looking like, you know, $7,500,000 later, what do you do? Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, that health care is an issue that we have to deal with in a country, and there are no good solutions. You can't deal with it without restructuring your entire tax code, and meaning that not just the rich pay, but everybody's going to pay more. Well, that's not what we want to do. Everybody wants somebody else to pay. If we want to have health care, we're all going to have to recognize there's a cost to that. If the European Union wants to have their, their union, there's a cost, and it's going to be loss of sovereignty to their countries, it's going to be loss of control over their budgets, and it's going to be loss of control over the value of their currency. And they may decide that it's worth it because they want the union. The United States, when we went from the Articles of Confederation to the, to the uh, Constitution, that was not a foregone conclusion when they called that meeting in uh, Philadelphia that we would walk away with the Constitution. But basically, you had four or five guys hijack that convention. Adams, Hamilton, Jefferson, Washington, men of stature, men who could command a presence, who got these guys at rooms and said, boys, we're not walking out of here without a Constitution. And we don't see that in Europe today. I don't, I don't see a, 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 a Hamilton or a, you know, a Madison, a Washington with a stature, and a plan to walk away with something. They're still trying to figure it out. Well, perhaps history hasn't quite delivered us to that moment yet. I've, I see that, you know, when I look at the this debt super cycle and I pull out my handy chart of total credit market debt start in the 70s, and we note that debt has been compounding faster than GDP for all of those decades since. And uh, that that breeds a certain type of mentality, institutions, social conventions, political parties, um, people who are potentially not trained in the art of negotiation and compromise. We've been able to have one of everything um, up to this point. We've put it on the credit card, as it were. And so now we're at that moment, I guess you're saying, that 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 super cycle has ended. Now we're down to the hard part, which is, yes, you have to set priorities. You have to make trade-offs. You can't have everything. No, we can't have a tax cut, two wars, and a functioning health care system. Pick one. Um, or two, maybe. But is that what you're saying, that, that you know, we're, we're down to the hard decisions? The line from a, a, gr- 
great Italian that people do not accept change until they uh, see the necessity and they only see the necessity in moments of crisis. We're at the place where, and, and the developed world in general is at the, at the place where we're going to have to change. I mean, Canada and Sweden went through this in the 90s, and you know everybody else looked around and said, oh, poor Canada, poor Sweden, and it wasn't fun for them. I mean, they had to, it was major restructuring on their parts, uh, and they've come through it now. And now they don't have the crisis because they, you know, they were like the cat on on the uh, hot stove. They're not getting on any stoves, hot or not. You mm-hmm. know, well, the developed world didn't learn a lesson from watching them, and 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 we went on. And now, sadly, simultaneously, we're seeing much of the developed world going to have this crisis uh, all at the same time, in, in, in you know, within three to four years of each other. Uh, that's not good for world growth. That's not good for globalization. All these things. So we have to. We're, we're at a place where we have to make hard decisions. And when you get politicians with a crisis, uh, it's hard to say what they're going to do. I mean, you know, I can tell you what I think they should do, but they're in a crisis. And when you read the stories of how decisions are made by politicians in the middle of the crisis, it's not comforting. I mean, they're picking up the phone to each other and say, Bill, what do you think we should do, Bill? I don't know, Jim, what do you think we should do? You know, uh, they're working it out as they go along. There's no master plan here. There's nobody with a playbook uh, that says, okay, well, this is time to call, you know, the, it, it's, it's third and long, it's, here's the play we've got. No, you're making it up as you go along. You just waltz into Congress with a, a three-page memo and a request for $750 billion. That's what you do. Well, let, let me just say this. I think the media, uh, I mean, we just, I'll, I'll date this uh, broadcast, but we just had Gingrich Saturday night, uh, you know, win in North uh, in South Carolina. And, uh, you know, on, on uh, Sunday morning I watched the talk shows. That's one of my vices. And uh, they just savaged Gingrich. And they savaged the voters who voted for Gingrich. I mean, these a lot of them were the conservatives doing it. Because they don't understand. The voters are scared, I think. A growing percentage of this country is scared because they look at the debt, they look at the deficit, and they say, this can't be good. Now, some of them understand the problems, but not many. They just instinctively know this can't be good. And they're right. Uh, and so they're, they're looking for somebody that will tell them, I can fix it. Well, I, you know, I like Newt. I've met him before. We text back and forth. But he can't fix it. Boehner can't fix it. I've met all these guys. There's no fix. There's a, a hard slog. Uh, there are things you can do that are better than others. And, you know, I, I hope that as a country we choose those. But we have a difficult uh, 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 road to hope. But 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 and and I think that's what voters are saying. They're saying, you know, guys, let's let's just let's make the difficult choices. Let's get on with. Now I've been reading you for a while, and you've seen these difficulties coming for that entire time. And for a good portion of that time, you've been using the term "muddle through," which you've used in this podcast as well. And um, if I could paraphrase, it's the position that things will neither be too great nor too awful. We, we'll muddle on through um, a tepid bowl of porridge, perhaps. Uh, now you've recently penned a piece entitled Staring into the Abyss, which captures a decidedly gloomier view, I would say, and um, that you now hold and seems to articulate far more serious risks than any lukewarm bowl of porridge I've ever run across has there been a shift in your thinking here at this point in time? Are, are you looking for something maybe different than muddle through right now? I, I, I certainly see the possibility. I don't, think, I don't think Europe muddles through. Europe is going to have serious recessions, you know, and, and some countries are going to experience depressions, as in, you know, four to five years of real turmoil. Greece has nothing, no choice. Portugal has no choice. Uh, Italy is going to to be in a long-term recession. France is going to, I think, in four or five years, hit the wall. I mean, these are countries that the word muddle through doesn't apply to. The U.S. has the potential to create a muddle through economy, and that's our best case. Now, if we don't solve the problem, then we don't muddle through. 
I I want to be optimistic, and I, you know, and and I hope we do. I mean, I I still think people in America are are, are slowly coming around. Uh, I'm in the process of talking with some other writers. Uh, we may, in fact, try to do a book uh, based around this. That that what we're hoping to do is set out the issues uh, without really prescribing a problem an, an answer in terms of whether it's better to have more health care or less health care, uh, whether it's have better to have, I mean, we're going to say, here's the costs. Here's, here's the choices that we can make. Now, we as a nation have to collectively come together and make some of these choices, but we need to understand that there are no choices which don't have costs. Uh, and, and, I mean, we can choose that we want less health care. It doesn't seem that the voters, I mean, when you get all the polls, they don't want that. Uh, they don't, also don't want higher taxes. You can't have both. We're going to have to choose. And we have to recognize that if we have higher taxes, it's going to slow growth down, and it's going to reduce potential employment. That's just the rules. That's how it works. Um, that may be a price we're willing to pay. That's what we've got to decide as a country. You know, we've got to this, you know, either that or we're going to have to spend less somewhere else. So you, you, you know, we, we, we can't continue on in the same pattern. So if we make the decisions, if we, you know, put ourselves on a, what I call a glide path to a balanced budget, we, can't do, we don't do it all at once. We don't wake up and say, we're going to balance it all today. Well, that's a depression for us. That would just be an economic uh, suicide. But we can reduce the deficit by, you know, 1% of GDP a year, 2% of GDP a year, uh, which is serious when you're deleveraging like that. That's a serious consequence uh, to GDP because I, I won't go into the equations today, but, but it, it does reduce potential GDP when you're already at 90% of debt, which is a headwind to growth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, to me, muddled through is, you know, 1% to 2% growth over time. And the U.S. has the potential of having that over four or five years while we're deleveraging, if we do it correctly. If we don't do it, then what we'll have is more or less of the same until the bond market starts to raise rates, and then we become Italy. So let me ask you a very important question here, which is to step outside of this economic arena for just a second. And, and this is a fairly germane question, I hope. Um, my view aligns uh, with, with what Jeremy Grantham has now come to as well around the idea that high oil prices are a new structural and permanent reality because we've passed geologically easy, cheap, high net energy oil. You know, there's the tar sands and the Gowar field in Saudi Arabia have nothing in common with each other from an energy return, um, from a capital uh, return standpoint. So does peak oil at all influence your, your outlook at this stage, um, or is this something you think that's uh, uh, not a concern right now? Well, I mean, I'm not really a believer in peak oil. Uh, I'm a believer in peak cheap oil, which is more to, to, the, to what you were saying. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, there's, there's plenty of energy out there that's just not cheap anymore. Uh, so we're going to end up having to become more efficient, and we're going to end up spending more of our resources on having that energy because we're an energy dependent culture and civilization so it means that we're going to be buying less of something else that's that's the hard uh, uh, fact of nature i mean until we somebody can you know get cold fusion to work or whatever but it does play into uh our situation i mean one of the things that we and the U.S. have to do is we have to figure out how to be energy independent because we can't deleverage our country and reduce our deficits until we become energy independent because you have to get your trade balance uh, together mm -hmm. in order to be able to get your fiscal balance together. That's another economic equation. It's it's until uh, you sit down with people and you understand it's it's arithmetic. It's balance. It's 400 years of accounting. But we in fact have to to get our trade deficit down in order to be able to deal with the federal deficit. Uh, all of those things have to equal zero at some point. And energy is a big part of our trade deficit. If we want to uh, balance the budget, we're going to have to become energy independent. And we can become ener energy independent within four to five years if we basically look around to each other and say, we're going to punch a, a lot of holes in the ground. We're going to bring, you know, we're, we're going to do what it takes 
to get that energy out, and we're also going to make ourselves more efficient. Uh, we can get there, but and it'll create a lot of jobs, by the way. Mm-hmm. But you know, you've got to have the willingness to do that. You have to decide. Uh, the a majority of the people have to override the the lurch to the left and saying, you know, all anything that has to do with carbon uh, uh, fuel is bad, and and we should let the civilization rot rather than um, uh, rather than use uh, carbon-based energy. Um, and we're, that, that's another cultural decision we have to make um, if we want to be able to uh, have any form of economy. We're going to have to, to 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 make some very very hard decisions there. Right. So I hear you saying that you know um, the end game has arrived, and the end game uh, we really only have a few choices here. You know, there's too much debt, so you're either going right. to pay it off, you're going to default on it, you're going to print it away. Some combination of all three. Um, and so the constructive steps that we need to take first is to understand the nature of the predicament. We have to just look at it and say, look, we're not going to print our, we're, we're not going back to how things used to be um, through any combination of, of magic policies. Uh, there's just, we're in a period of deleveraging. So we can either do it responsibly or we could do it chaotically. Those are our, seem to be our, our choices here. And, um, and that there's a, a, a series of priorities that are going to have to be established, which means we have to get the dialogue open so we're having the right conversations. Um, difficult in this country in an election year uh, because we seem to default to, I, in my judgment, um, non-priority discussions. But at any rate, uh, I, I, I feel that around the constructive steps that maybe our society in the U.S. could take is an individual, though. If you, you know, I know a lot of concerned individuals. Some of them are very wealthy people. Some of them have no money. They're concerned for the same sets of reasons you articulated around the voters. Something's wrong. Um, what do we do here? What is the concerned individual sitting here at this moment in the timeline? What do they do that helps them best protect their quality of life at this point? The first thing you've got to do is recognize that this is not business as usual. Uh, you don't stick your money in an index and hope it's, it's going to grow. Uh, it's going to be volatile. Uh, your measure for investing should be zero rather than how did you do relative to the market, which should be an absolute return type world. Um, you're not going to get the compound growth and returns that, that you've had in the past that you wanted to have. Um, but that's not what you're trying to do. You're trying to get to the other side of this crisis. Uh, and you're trying to get to the other side of the crisis with as much of your wealth as you can uh, have today and as you can save uh, so that when the opportunities do come, when we do get to the other side of the crisis, and we will, that you're, you have the ability to uh, take advantage of the opportunities that are going to come. I mean, that's alternative investments. Uh, I think there should be some gold there. Uh, you're going to have to look at uh, uh, more strategic investments what's going to do well in this type of environment, a lot more income-oriented, a lot more absolute return-oriented. There are hedge funds, commodity trading funds that are starting to become available to the average 40 act, uh, average person in, in 40 act mutual funds. For higher net worth investors, they have different opportunities, which are they have a little bit bigger menu. And, and I sat down with one very, very, very large fund uh, in Asia, when I was there last week, and they said, you know, given everything you're talking about, John, what, we should, what should we do? And I said, well, you've got, you know, X billions now. Your goal for the year should be to have the same number of X billions at the end of the year. You should manage this portfolio for a 0% return. And if you get anything extra, that's fine. Mm-hmm. But, you know, if you're, going, if you're going to have equities, you need to hedge it. Everything needs to be hedged because... We don't know what Europe is going to do. You're putting your entire portfolio at risk to some political decisions that nobody around this table knows what those decisions are going to be, so you don't know how to position. And those decisions can be good ones for the market, or they can be bad ones. Mm -hmm. And today, I think that's a risk that investors should be very, very careful of. And we should just recognize that that's the time period we're in. It's not the 80s and 90s anymore. I mean, when I was writing in the very, very late 90s and early 2000s, I came out with Bullseye Investing in 2003. I said, guys, we're in a secular bear market. The market's going to go sideways for a very long period of time, you know, average of 17 years. People were telling me, John, you're such a 
pessimist you're mm-hmm. a bear and i'm going well i'm just telling you here's what the cycles look like here's what the data looks like uh, i mean and here's what the research gives us about human psychology and sure enough i mean what i was saying was going to happen is pretty much turn coming out in four or five years i'll probably turn bullish again on the markets uh at, at some point because we hit the bottom of that cycle and people will say, John, what are you looking at? You're smoking some funny data. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, how can you be bullish? Um, I'll say, well, the data's telling us it's time to start thinking about taking some more risk and putting the risk back on the table. These things move in cycles, and investors need to recognize that as these cycles, I mean, between the secular bulls and bears as they change, the style of investing that works in one is the opposite of what works in the other. A period of maximum safety, a return of principle, not a return on. Uh, he who loses least wins most. All of those bear market aphorisms. All of those bear market aphorisms. And, 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 and income. I mean, if you had just been been in bonds, you know, uh, starting, which is what I was telling people in, in, 2000 and, in 2001, 2002, just you're, you're managing for income. Mm-hmm. Treasuries. Treasuries have outperformed uh, uh Stock market indexes. Uh, <laughs> you know, you didn't need all the risk and the volatility. And if you if you were in corporate bonds, if you had taken the income, clipped the coupons, you're way ahead. One of the things that I've been saying for a long time, John, is that uh, we're all speculators now, and it's a terrible place to be if you consider yourself an investor. We're speculating on what the Fed might do, the ECB, or politicians. And as you very wisely pointed out before, politicians tend to to enact whatever solutions are lying around in a moment of crisis. So we just don't know what those solutions might be. Um, I, I really appreciate your time, your insights, and the exceptionally clear delivery of all these complicated subjects. Please tell everyone how they can follow you in your work. Ah, well, that's the easy part. Go to johnmalden.com, uh, M-A-U-L-D-I-N, and just stick your email address in. And you become one of my one million closest friends. It's a free letter. <laughs> nice. You know, you might, if you haven't looked at the book, The End Game, I think it's as pertinent today as it was when it came out less than a year ago. Uh, it's getting great reviews. More and more people are picking it up. It's one of these you know, books that uh, is selling more as time goes on uh, rather than you know, falling off, which is what typically happens, because people look at it and they're going, wow, this is happening. What he said was going to happen is happening. What else did he say? And we kind of lay it out. I mean, there was a, there's a lot of things and signposts in there that we haven't come to yet that I think we're still on the road to. So, uh, But that's a... Uh, that's in the book, and it's for another uh, another day and another interview. Well, fantastic. That book is Endgame, End of the Debt Supercycle, How It Changes Everything. I'm sure you can find that uh, everywhere, including Amazon, very easily. So, John, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure, and I hope we can do this again sometime. Thank you very much. You got it. Bye-bye. Bye. This concludes this podcast by Chris Martinson. To gain further insight into where things stand today and what might happen tomorrow, please visit chrismartinson.com. That's C-H-R-I-S-M-A-R-T-E-N-S-O-N dot com. Please join Chris Martinson next time to continue your journey toward awareness, understanding, and action.